Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 10 lecture for microbiology. The previous chapter, chapter 9, was all about how we can kill and get rid of microbes in our surroundings and chapter 10 is all about how we get rid of microbes that are in our bodies. So we're going to be talking about various forms of antimicrobial treatments. So a little bit of history about antibiotics and antimicrobials. They're relatively new in human history. So infectious disease used to be a major, major killer of um, people, particularly very young people. Infants and children oftentimes died of childhood illnesses, which now we think of as commonplace and you just go take an antibiotic for, or that we have just eradicated through vaccination. So um, we've really, through antibiotics and vaccines, done an amazing job at reducing the amount of death and disease from infectious infections. So the first uh, antibiotic really that was discovered was penicillin. Salversan on this list, this is just a list of discovery of different antibiotics throughout the 1900s. Um, Salversan doesn't, I don't really count that one. It was arsenic based, so it was super toxic. It was just basically like drinking arsenic. Um, so it doesn't really count. Penicillin was really the first um, selective, with selective toxicity, and we'll talk about selective toxicity. Penicillin was discovered in 1928, but it wasn't actually developed for use in people until the 1940s just goes to show how long it really takes from discovery to use in people because it has to be studied, it has to be manufactured and mass produced, it has to go through like clinical safety testing. Okay, so penicillin, while it was the first one discovered, was not actually the first one in use. The first one in use widely was sulfonamide and sulfonamide has a fun story. So it was discovered um, at Bayer the same maker of aspirin, a German company, back in 1930. It was um, a researcher, they were studying various azo dyes or sulfa dyes for antimicrobial properties. And this one researcher, his name was, I think, Gerard de Bach, de Burke, and I can't, I can't remember. Um, and he was researching a sulfa drug and it was having really promising result in the lab and then one day his daughter like cut her arm she was like six and she got a really bad staph or strep infection i can't remember but she got a really bad infection and it ended up causing cellulitis and she was you know either about to or already had become septic and it was very likely she was going to die and at least need an amputation of her arm from this terrible infection. And so out of desperation, he ran to the lab, grabbed a vial of this sulfonamide, went home, treated his daughter with it, and she got better and she lived and she didn't lose her arm. And so that's a common trend you'll see in the history of medicine, even as late as the 1980s. Heck, even in the 1990s and 2000s, there's examples of scientists experimenting on themselves or their family members with new therapies that they're developing. Um, so that was so sulfonamide, sulfonamide and sulfonamide, I never know how to say it, um, came into production pretty quickly because it was just, it was a dye that already existed. It wasn't like a new compound. So Bayer was able to produce that. And it wasn't until penicillin was able to be mass produced in the 1940s that it really took over the market. Um, so then you'll see, so there was sort of a slow discovery. And then in the late 1940s, early 1950s through like, let's say 1980, there was a lot of drug discovery in this area. So we found tons and tons of antibiotics. And we found them all pretty much the same way. And we basically maxed out our discovery ability uh, of finding antibiotics. And that was basically by looking at bacteria, various bacteria in soil and culture and fungi and culturing them and looking for ones that produce antibiotics. Um, since 1990, we really haven't discovered any new antibiotics. There's a couple that I'll talk about that have been discovered, but haven't been brought to market. Um, 
And so we're still, we're in this phase where instead of discovering new antibiotics and saving lives, these were considered miracle drugs. Like people died all the time from infections and now fatal infections were easily treatable with a pill. Um, but now we're finding that those pills aren't working anymore and we are into the era of antibiotic resistance and we need to find new therapies. So um, the discovery of penicillin is a great story. It's a classic story in microbiology. So pretty much all antibiotics that we have on the market are actually natural compounds or derivatives of natural compounds that are produced by microbes, mostly soil microbes. So think about soil. There's lots of different fungi and bacteria that live there all mixed together in the soil and they all are fighting for resources and they have to be able to sort of live together and not overtake each other's territory. So they have to be able to sort of defend their territory. So microbes in the soil oftentimes make compounds to kill other types of microbes in order to guard their turf, like literally. So if we can culture those microbes and get them to produce those compounds for us, we can we can purify those compounds and um, synthesize them as drugs. And that's how the, the first drug discovery, uh, antibiotic discovery really was made. And that was by Alexander Fleming in 1928. And it's a very serendipitous story. So you can see this picture of Alex Fleming right here and you can see the lab behind him and you can see there's all these Petri dishes just stacked on the bench top, okay? That was very common practice in his lab and in many labs in those days. They, um, you know, he was culturing bacteria, he was studying staphylococci, and he had them plated on these Petri dishes. Then he just left the plates like on the table. They were, they were closed, but there was a, a window near these plates and he left it open over the weekend. And he came back on, you know, Monday and, and found that some of the plates had become contaminated with fungus, that there was fungus growing on the plate. And remember fungi mold, like fungus molds, they have that fuzzy, that fuzzy look to them. So they look different than the way bacteria grow. And uh, what, you know, he could have done is just been like, oh, drats, these are contaminated and just thrown them away, right? But he didn't because he's a scientist and scientists are very skilled at observation. And so what he did was he looked at the plates and he thought, hmm, that's interesting. In the area uh, where the fungus is growing, there seems to be a zone around the fungus where the bacteria don't grow. That's odd. And in that maybe the fungus is producing something that's inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. And so he got together with some chemist friends and together they were able to isolate the compound that was made by the mold. The mold was called penicillium. That was the genus of the mold species. And so the drug, they called it penicillin. And so even though this discovery was made in 1928, it took a lot of years to figure out how to produce enough penicillium. They had to find strains of penicillium mold that produced high amounts of penicillin and then grow up the, the mold, um, isolate the penicillin, purify it. It's quite a lot of work on the manufacturing end. So they didn't have enough to give a dose a sing they didn't they had enough for a single dose to a single person in the early 1940s and then ultimately got it up to be mass produced by the 1944 which was good timing since that was um, towards the end of world war ii when the u.s went into war so there it was um sort of revolutionized treatment of infections in the field in, in war um, for soldiers so when it comes to different types of antimicrobial therapy, there is some vocabulary to know. So all of the therapies, most of the therapies we're going to be talking about are chemotherapeutic. So the term chemotherapy literally means treatment using chemicals. So antibiotics are a form of chemotherapy, technically speaking. Now, colloquially, we tend to think of chemotherapy specifically in the field of cancer, the chemicals that are used to treat cancer. Um, 
it's kind of a misuse of the word because all, I mean, taking Advil is chemotherapy, technically. So the way we use it socially and colloquially is not really correct. So technically, all of these are types of chemotherapies, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> some types of chemotherapy are to prevent disease. Vaccines are a classic preventive medicine. So any type of preventive medicine is called a prophylaxis or prophylactic medicine. Another example of prophylaxis is if you're going to have surgery, like if you're having oral surgery, like a root canal, usually your dentist will prescribe you an antibiotic to start taking right before the surgery and to, like, you know, to take for a couple of days. Um, and that is to prevent infection at the surgical site. So it's not to treat anything, it's specifically to prevent infection. Um, antimicrobial chemotherapy is any type of, of chemotherapy that prevents, or that, sorry, that treats infection. So prophylaxis prevents it, and antimicrobials kill microbes. It's literally, it means against microbes. Um, usually when we're talking about antibiotics, specifically antibiotics, we're talking about antibacterial medications. So there are no antibiotics for viral diseases. Technically, we don't even use the word antibiotic for um, fungal or parasitic diseases. We have antifungals and we have antihelminthics. Um, all together, the antibiotics, the antifungals, the antihelminthics, all together would be antimicrobials. So antimicrobial would be the umbrella term. Um, antibiotics is the term for things that treat bacteria specifically. Um, drugs can be either naturally derived or they can be synthetic. So most drugs start out as naturally derived from like penicillin came from that penicillium mold. But then we, be, we learned how to modify it and synthesize it in the lab, organic chemists learned how to just do organic chemistry and synthesize it. So it um, it's, can be a synthetic form. So uh, a lot of drugs on the market now are actually modified forms of penicillins. There's a lot of psyllins and they, are, they took the original penicillin and then chemically modified it. So it's semi-synthetic. It's sort of natural, it's naturally derived, but then it's been altered. Um, and the benefit, of course, of synthetic, of synthesis is that you can mass produce things more easily if you can synthesize it in the lab versus if you have to just grow lots of, of fungi and then um, purify it, that it takes longer and more work and more money. We also can classify antimicrobials as narrow spectrum or broad spectrum. So a broad spectrum broad is wide, it, that's a drug that kills a wide range of organisms, lots of different types of bacteria, gram positive and gram negative, versus a narrow spectrum drug which just targets specific types of cells, maybe just gram negatives or just uh, gram positives. So with antimicrobials, the sort of guiding principle when, when pharmaceuticals are trying to develop new drugs is they want to minimize the toxicity of the drug to the human and maximize the toxicity of the drug to the microbe. So I, it, you know, the ideal is that you kill the pathogen without harming the host. Um, and that's not always perfectly possible, but that's the ultimate goal. And so the idea is when they're screening for potential drug compounds, they're looking for things that are selectively toxic. So they will test them against bacteria, for example. If they kill the bacteria, great. The next thing they do is they test them on human cells and see are they toxic to human cells in a dish. And if they are, well then they scrap that one. It's no good, it's just toxic to everything. What they want are compounds that are toxic to bacteria, to pathogens, but not toxic to human cells. So we call that selective toxicity. 
it's easier to do with bacteria because bacteria are prokaryotes and humans are eukaryotes. So there's a lot of differences in our cells. There's a lot of very, we have very different shaped enzymes and proteins and metabolic pathways. So there's more things to sort of target there. Antivirals and antihelminthics are harder to make. Antivirals, because viruses really have very few parts that are specific, they target our host cells. And so it's very hard to just find a drug that works only, that's only toxic to the virus and not the host cells. And then um, with helminths, helminths are eukaryotes, so their proteins and enzymes are very similar, much more similar to ours. So it's hard to find drugs that selectively are toxic to worms, but not humans. So when it comes to antibiotics that target bacteria, there are a, a few common um, targets, I guess, within the cell. So the first one, and penicillin was the first antibiotic discovered and it falls into this category, um, is that there's a, there are classes of drugs that inhibit cell wall synthesis. So humans don't have cell walls, first of all, and, and last of all, I suppose. So humans don't have cell walls, bacteria do. Um, whether they're gram positive or gram negative, and most bacteria fall into one of those categories, uh, they make a cell wall out of peptidoglycan. And so if we can stop them from being able to make their cell wall, it really weakens their armor and it makes them a lot easier to kill. Um, we can have classes of drugs that inhibit protein synthesis. Usually they inhibit the ribosome, and at some point, they bind to the ribosome and inhibit translation um, of prokaryotic RNA into proteins. And if so, if the cell can't make proteins, it can't live. Uh, another thing that it could do is mess with the DNA somehow. So it could messing with the DNA can either inhibit or prohibit DNA replication, so then cells can't divide properly but it can also inhibit transcription, the ability of RNA polymerase to read the genes and ultimately start gene expression. Um, a fourth class are drugs that inhibit certain enzymes that are part of metabolic pathways that are unique to prokaryotes that eukaryotes don't have. And then the fifth way, the fifth mechanism, is to disrupt the membrane, disrupt the cell membrane, the lipid uh, bilayer. So the first class that I mentioned are the, the cell wall inhibitors, all right? So mechanism of drug action here is cell wall inhibition. And these are a class of drugs called the beta-lactam antibiotics. And beta-lactam is just the name of this chemical structure, this yellow uh, square-shaped part of the molecule. All right, that's in chemistry called a beta-lactam ring. So you'll notice that all of these different classes of um, drugs all contain this beta-lactam ring in their structure. And that beta-lactam ring is recognized by this enzyme called um, transpeptidase. And transpeptidase is important for building the peptidoglycan layer, the, the cell wall of bacteria. So remember, peptidoglycan, it's, a, it's carbohydrates that are linked together by peptides. And that cross-linking, that linking of the carbohydrates with the peptides, is due to this enzyme called transpeptidase. And so transpeptidase goes along making these cross-links. Well, the beta-lactam drugs, they covalently bind to the uh, transpeptidase and permanently inhibit it, and permanently knock it out of, fun of action. And so then from then on, the bacteria have no way of synthesizing peptidoglycan. If they don't have peptidoglycan, they can't use it to build their cell wall. And if they don't have a cell wall, they're very prone to rupture with from osmotic pressure. So um, that is how penicillin and all of its descendants work. So some other drugs, I do want you to know 
that pen, put a star next to penicillin. I definitely want you to know that penicillin is a beta-lactam drug. Um, I don't care if you remember cephalosporins and monobactams and carbapenems are, but it might be helpful to know for a future class. So um, there you go. All right, another popular mechanism of action of these drugs is protein synthesis inhibition. And the common way to do that is to bind to the ribosome. And so this is a slide showing you, a here's the messenger RNA, and this big yellow thing is the ribosome, the large subunit and the small subunit. And here's some tRNAs that bring in the amino acid, and here's the growing polypeptide that's forming in translation. Okay, So you can see all these red arrows pointing to different spots in the uh, process where these different actions take effect. So chloramphenicol is a drug that happens to bind to the large portion of the, of the, um, the large subunit of the ribosome. Um, tetracycline or erythromycin also binds to the large subunit of the ribosome, but at a different spot. Streptomycin changes the shape of the small subunit and um, tetracycline interferes with the ability of tRNAs to attach. So they all in some form or fashion disrupt translation because they mess with the ribosome and the tRNA's ability to bind and read the mRNA. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I do have this question here, any exceptions to selective toxicity? So the reason that these are selectively toxic is because these compounds selectively bind to and recognize the 70S ribosome. They do not bind to or inhibit the 80S ribosome. Remember, prokaryotes have 70S ribosomes, eukaryotes have 80S ribosomes, so it is selectively toxic. Um, but if you recall, eukaryotes do have some 70S ribosomes. Where? In their mitochondria and, if they're a plant, in their chloroplasts. But for us, in our mitochondria. So there is some evidence that some of these antibiotics do cause mitochondrial toxicity as a side of that some of the side effects of the drug are due to the toxicity to mitochondrial ribosomes. Uh, still, the sort of risk benefit it outweighs the toxicity of the drug. Um, sulfonamides, the class that was uh, discovered by the German researcher at Bayer who gave it to his daughter, which, by the way, I forgot to finish that story. So, um, so he discovered it in 1930. I think it was in production by 19, you know, 31. In 1935, no, in 1944, I think, 1940s, somewhere in the 1940s, before the end of World War II he won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of sulfonamide. Um, this was before penicillin was available. This so sulfonamide was still the only antibiotic on the market. He won the Nobel Prize, but he wasn't allowed to accept it because Germany was boycotting the Nobel Prize because a few years earlier, um, the Nobel Peace Prize had gone to someone who was like anti-Nazi. And so for years, Germany actually boycotted the Nobel Prize. So he, he was able to eventually accept it after World War II was over. But um, fun piece of history trivia for you there. Okay, so the, so the way that sulfonamides work is they actually block the synthesis of folic acid. So folic acid is needed for DNA synthesis. We can, as humans, we don't actually have a pathway to make folic acid. We just get it from our diet. In fact, pregnant women have to take folic acid supplements to make sure that they're able to make plenty of DNA for the reproducing cells in the fetus. Um, 
but bacteria have a special metabolic pathway that is not found in human cells. So they have enzymes that are unique to them and sulfonamides bind and inhibit those enzymes. And so basically it causes the bacteria to starve. They can't, they can't make DNA properly. Um, so those are sulfonamides for you. Uh, some other classes, fluoroquinolones. These, so these two, fluoroquinolones and rifampin are drugs that bind to the DNA or actually to DNA polymerase. No, take it back. They, they block DNA in some form or fashion. So fluoroquinolones, they bind to the bacterial version of topoisomerase. Remember, that's the one that spins like a top, so it unwinds the DNA. And so it prevents the DNA from unwinding, so it makes it hard to replicate the DNA because you can't unwind it. If you can't unwind it, you can't get replication started. Rifampin, or otherwise it might lock it in place so that you can't keep going and opening that replication fork. Rifampin binds to RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase comes in to do transcription and then rifampin binds to it and now it's stuck. It can't do anything. It can't do its job. So if you can't do gene expression, you can't live. And so that's how those two things work. They interfere at the DNA level. And then lastly, we have polymyxins or cholestins, which are membrane disruptors. And I honest, I'm, I'll be honest, I don't understand exactly how they are selectively toxic. I will look into that and get back to you in a live session. Um, but they somehow are selectively toxic for uh, bacterial membranes over eukaryotic membranes. And so they can interact with the lipids in the bilayer and disrupt it, very similar to what we saw with soaps and detergents, surfactants. All right, gram positives, however, are fairly resistant because they have that thick cell wall and the polymyxins don't really penetrate that. Gram negatives are much more sensitive because they have that outer membrane. So polymyxins are really good for gram negative bacteria, not so good for gram positive. To go back to a previous uh, class of drugs, the beta lactams, which target cell wall, all right, beta lactam drugs are much um, better at killing gram positive organisms because they have a very thick cell wall and they're really handicapped if their cell wall is taken out. Whereas gram negatives already get by with a pretty weak cell wall. So, and they also have that second membrane, which prevents some of those drugs from even entering the cell at all. So, polymyxins are better against gram negatives. Beta-lactam drugs are better against gram positives. Um, so uh, just to carry this out to a clinical situation, I think I told a story once where my daughter had an infection in her lymph node and they did a culture and sensitivity test. They drained it and then cultured the bacteria and they did a gram stain. And that was the first test they did as soon as they got the sample and found that it was a gram-positive bacteria. So sometimes just knowing whether it's gram-positive or gram-negative can inform the doctors on which drugs are a good or a bad choice. You don't need to necessarily know the species to start presumptive antibiotic treatment. So that brings us to the sort of spectrum of effectiveness of different drugs. So there are some drugs that are broad spectrum, they're effective against more than one group of bacteria, and others that are narrow spectrum, they target very specific bacteria. So if you don't know what's causing an infection, a person comes in, they have all of the signs of infection, they have a fever, they have redness and swelling, and they have high white blood cell counts, but we're waiting on culture and sensitivity results. So in that time period, a lot of times doctors will start treating with a broad spectrum antibiotic like tetracycline. Look at the spectrum of tetracycline, all right? It can treat most gram negative bacteria, gram positive bacteria, even chlamydias and rickettsias, which aren't gram, they don't have, they're not gram positive or gram negative, okay? So tetracyclines, carbapenems also cover a wide range of 
of gram positive and gram negative organisms. So those are two broad spectrum drugs that are often given um, before you know what is causing it. Then once you know what exactly is causing the infection, then you can switch to a narrow spectrum drug. Ideally, you, you want to treat patients with narrow spectrum drugs because, because remember, antibiotics are not, while they are selectively toxic for bacteria versus you know your, the host cells, they're not very selectively toxic of different bacteria cells. So they kill like not just the E. coli that's causing a, an infection, but they'll kill a whole bunch of good bacteria as well. So to minimize the sort of the casualties of your commensal bacteria, you will always want to try to use narrow spectrum drugs when possible. Um, so it's not uncommon for initial treatment to begin with a broad spectrum antibiotic and then um, continue treatment with a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Uh, another use for broad spectrum antibiotics is um, in prophylaxis. So if you are about to have surgery and they want to make sure that you don't get an infection, they might give you broad spectrum drugs prophylactically. So when drugs are developed, they're usually discovered in their natural form, like penicillin was discovered from the penicillium fungus. And then scientists, chemists studied, they, they solved the, the structure of it, and then they started to tinker with it uh, using, you know, synthetic organic chemistry, and they imp were able to improve upon it. So um, penicillin G is the original penicillin, and it's still in use, we still use it. Um, but it's not stable enough to make it through the intestinal system, so it must be injected. Penicillin G is injectable, but injectable drugs are not the most convenient, and so some of these modifications that were made were to make it um, ingestible. Um, so that made it just easier to use. Uh, other things. Um, Penicillin is a relatively narrow spectrum of action, but my mo by modifying it, ampicillin and amoxicillin actually have a broad spectrum of action, so it can work on a wider group of bacteria, some negative, gram-negative bacteria. Um, that's where, yeah. Oh, and there's also, we're gonna talk about different bacteria having resistance to antibiotics and since penicillin was the first in use it was one of the first types of resistance that bacteria developed was penicillin resistance or resistance the ability basically to cut these molecules that contain beta lactam rings and so some of these modified forms um, are able to they're sort of um, invisible to those defenses of bacteria. So they are resistant to bacterial resistance, if that makes sense. So antibiotic resistance is a huge, huge problem. Um, and it's directly related to biofilms, which we've mentioned previously. So biofilms form, communities of bacteria get together and they form these biofilms, which are dense populations of microbes. They can contain multiple types of microbes, multiple species, and um, they contribute to antibiotic resistance in a couple of ways. For one, they are, they tend to be antibiotic resistant just because they're so thick and it's hard for antibiotics to fully penetrate the biofilm and kill all the bacteria. Also, the bacteria in the center tend to be sort of low metabolic activity, and which means they're not really taking up the antibiotic and processing it. So it's they're getting a lower level and it's just not toxic to them. Also, when you expose bacteria to low levels of antibiotic, that selects for mutants. It actually, um, it like sort of, uh, contributes to the evolution of antibiotic resistance. And so low level exposure in the middle of this biofilm results in mutations for antibiotic resistance. So then you get an antibiotic resistant bug and now it's uh, available to continue reproducing, to spread, and now you have antibiotic resistance. 
So biofilms are, they, whether or not the bacteria in the biofilm are antibiotic resistant, the, whoa, the biofilm itself is antibiotic resistant, but also the biofilms can contribute to resistance because essentially what happens if you have a biofilm is you get put on antibiotics for a long time trying to get rid of that biofilm. It usually takes uh, a long-term antibiotic therapy and long-term antibiotic therapy contributes to the formation of antibiotic resistance. So it's really just such a double-edged sword, I suppose. Um, biofilms tend to happen when you have artificial materials embedded in your body. So this relatively, you know, new surgical advancements have allowed us to use like artificial joints and like mesh and artificial valves and all of those synthetic products and plastics um, and materials just end up being good sites for bacteria to grow. Um, any tissue where it's not getting good blood supply, so like chronic wounds that aren't healing very well, uh, become sites where biofilms can form. Um, if you have any impairments of your immune system, then biofilms can form very common in patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, in their lungs, they can form these biofilms. And uh, another thing that can contribute to biofilm formation is people who don't, if they don't finish their antibiotics, um, and then, so they kill most of the bacteria, but not all of it. They don't let the bio antibiotics finish their finish the job. Some of those bacteria hang around, and that exposure to the low level of antibiotics ends up causing them to become antibiotic resistant or allowing them to establish themselves in a biofilm. So, um, biofilms have to be treated differently than other infections. So you can't just give someone oral antibiotics if they have a biofilm. You oftentimes can't even just give them IV antibiotics. The film itself, that physical structure, needs to be attacked. So a common biofilm infection is one on artificial joints, like a hip joint, like a titanium hip joint. And oftentimes the way it has to be treated surgically, the, the um, Surgeon has to go in, pull out the joint, scrub it, wash it clean, soak it in antibiotics, same thing, scrape any bacteria out of that joint tissue, soak it in antibiotics, and then put it back in. Like there's just no way to treat it without physically wiping off that biofilm. Sometimes it's on a structure that you can't do that. So there is some research into using various enzymes that actually break up some of the sticky material that holds the biofilm together. Um, but it's kind of a double-edged sword because antibiotics can lead to the formation of biofilms, but you also kind of need antibiotics to treat biofilms. Uh, so it's, it doesn't always work out great. So antimicrobial resistance is a huge, huge problem. We call it drug resistance. And it's an evolutionary response of microbes that they have this, you know, toxin basically in their environment. The microbes that sur that um, survive best in the presence of that will continue to reproduce. So the mechanisms by which microbes can become resistant is A, by spontaneous mutation. So microbe is dividing, its cell is undergoing or its DNA is undergoing DNA replication, and oops, DNA polymerase makes a little mistake. And that mistake ends up causing a change in a protein that happens to actually benefit the bacteria. Yay, for the bacteria, not for us. So spontaneous mutations, we usually think of mutations as being bad things that result in like death of an organism, but mutations can also be beneficial things and give them new qualities. So spontaneous mutation, just a lucky, a lucky error, basically. Um, the second way that it can, that microbes can become antibiotic resistant is through um, acquiring genetic material through horizontal gene transfer, like conjugation and transformation and transfection, all of those things we talked about in chapter eight. And then lastly, they can become resistant 
through, and this isn't, I don't know that this is really like true resistance. I mean, I guess it is, is um, by slowing down their metabolism. So bacterial endospores, they are in a dormant state, so they are not affected by antibiotics. And biofilms, which are in a very thick, you know, a thick film, <laughs> are also sort of impervious to antibiotics. So this is how drug resistance by spontaneous mutation works. Um, so you have a population of bacteria, one of them, I mean, they all probably have some kind of spontaneous mutation, but one of them has a spontaneous mutation that results in drug resistance. Um, and if this, this population just went on dividing in an environment with no antibiotics, that drug resistant bacteria might die off and its offspring may no longer continue to exist. But if antibiotics are introduced, it's the only one that's really going to be able to keep reproducing. And so soon enough, you end up with an entire population of drug resistant bacteria. And a few years ago, some researchers at Harvard demonstrated this in an experiment that's kind of terrifying. And we're going to watch the video here. It's literally it's what Aspen you're Dental's watching Everyday Smiles event where new patients get a full exam in this video is bacterial evolution. Like you're watching evolution real time. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. In 11 days, it took 11 days for them to become, uh, to build up resistance to a thousand times concentration of a drug that they were sensitive to a few days earlier. So just before I move on, just wanna take a moment to talk about those words sensitive and resistant. Sensitive, if a, if a bacteria is sensitive to an antibiotic, that means it gets killed by it. If it's resistant to an antibiotic, it means it doesn't get killed by it. So those bacteria were all essentially these green guys, and there was one red guy in the mix, and, um, and we actually got to see that red bacteria continue to evolve and um, proliferate. So another way that bacteria can obtain drug resistance is through horizontal gene transfer. So all the different ways that they can trade their DNA like Pokemon cards. So remember, bacteria have plasmids. They very often have plasmids, these extra bonus pieces of DNA. So in this picture here, these green guys, 
um, here's the chromosomal DNA and here's a plasmid and that yellow piece on the plasmid represents a, an antibiotic resistant gene or an R factor. The whole plasmid is called an R factor, a resistance factor. And so bacteria here, you can see all these bacteria are doing conjugation. They're mating and they're giving their resistance genes to each other. So in this diagram, the green bacteria represent good bacteria, bacteria that are normal residents of our gut. And the red bacteria represent pathogens. So sometimes what happens is you have an infection with a pathogen, and while that pathogen is in residence in your gut, um, it might pass on some genes to your gut microbes, but also your gut microbes can pass on genes to the pathogen while it's there. And your gut microbes oftentimes pick up anti become antibiotic resistance, resistant through the use of antibiotics. You get sick, you take some antibiotics. And it behooves you, in a way, to have antibiotic resistant normal flora because they're the good guys. You don't want to kill them off when you're sick. Um, but the problem with that is that then those good guys, these green normal flora, can conjugate with pathogens and give them that antibiotic resistance. And then when you spread your disease, you're spreading now antibiotic resistant pathogens. So there's just way too much conjugation. They're very promiscuous bacteria, and they just spread these things like wildfire. Um, so that's conjugation. Another way that genes can be transferred is through transformation. Transformation is not pictured here, but remember that's when microbes go fishing um, in their environment so they can just pick up plasmids just that are just you know swimming around in the extracellular fluid um, and then the third way is through transduction and transduction is when a phage transfers DNA so a phage may infect a pathogen and then accidentally trap some of that pathogen DNA and then go infect some other cell um, and then it starts producing a path or a toxin. So, um, and in this case right here, notice that that little piece of, of, of toxin DNA has been incorporated into the bacterial genome. It's not in a plasmid, it's in the genome. So now it permanently has that, that toxin production. Okay, so those are the three ways of horizontal gene transfer, conjugation, transformation, and transduction. Um, so this is really a very big way. So mutation, yes, that happens. And we increase the rate of mutation when we use too many antibiotics, but we also get a lot of, of resistance from horizontal gene transfer from resistant bacteria, giving that resistance to other bacteria. So how is it that, that bacteria can be resistant to drugs? Like, how do they resist? What's the mechanism? So there's about five different ways that bacteria can resist drugs. The first is that they are able to destroy the drug. They, they, may, they have some enzyme that can literally chew it up. And that's what this little shark is an animation or a, an illustration of. So it's going nom, 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 nom. So if this little orange diamond represents the antibiotic drug. Um, one thing that bacteria can do is, is, ha is find enzymes or evolve enzymes that chew up that drug. And that's what beta-lactamase does. Beta-lactamase is also sometimes called penicillinase and it chews up beta-lactam drugs like penicillin. It can just chew them up so then they don't work anymore. Um, another thing that bacteria can do is they can change the permeability um, and otherwise stop letting the drug in. So that's what's being illustrated by this guy over here saying, you shall not pass. All right, so they, the permeability of the membrane changed so the drug can no longer get in. It just bounces off. Uh, another thing that a lot of bacteria have are these multi-drug resistant pumps. They're literally pumps that once the drug comes in, the pump can just pump it back out just spit it back out. And that's illustrated by this little ninja guy right here, 
the drug goes in and he just kicks it right back out pow um and then la the number four having an altered binding site bye puppy um so if the for example penicillin binds to transpeptidase that's the enzyme that it inhibits but if a bacteria um, changes the shape of transpeptidase so that it but penicillin no longer binds to it then it'll be resistant to penicillin um, and then lastly some bacteria can just find an alternate pathway so this doesn't work for um, building a cell wall but for instance if a if an enzyme, if a bacteria found a different way to build a cell wall without transpeptidase, used a different enzyme, then it would be a moot point. Penicillin would be a moot point. Um, this does happen with sulfa drugs, resistance to sulfa drugs. Uh, the bacteria just find a different way to synthesize folic acid using different enzymes that aren't inhibited. Uh, and that's shown here. So the on this slide, this is just a, tech, a table from your textbook looking at how some of these different things work. So that first mechanism of chewing up, of digesting the drug, so penicillinase cleaves that beta-lactam ring, so the drug is no longer active and effective. Um, cells can uh, change their receptor, so the a lot of drugs enter cells through receptors or channels, and if they just change the shape of those receptors or channels, then the drug can no longer get in. Um, they can have multi-drug resistant pumps where the drug does get in, but then it gets pumped right back out. They could have changed binding sites. So if they're, if a drug binds to the ribosome at a certain spot, if that spot changes shape just a little bit and the drug can't bind there anymore. And then with sulfa drugs, whoops, uh, you have a pathway to get to a certain product. If an enzyme in that pathway is inhibited, they just find another path to get to that product. So those are all different ways that bacteria can avoid uh, antibiotics or antibiotic effects. So antibiotic resistance is, a, is an urgent problem, or maybe we could say was an incredibly urgent problem before the pandemic in 2019. So in early 2019, uh, the CDC issued, well, actually the, they issued their first threat report in 2013, and then they reissued it again in 2019, outlining all of these potentially catastrophic uh, antibiotic resistant situations. Um, and the problem is that we have more and more antibiotic resistance and yet we still have no new antibiotic drugs on the market. And it's partly because antibiotics are not really very ec economically lucrative and it costs a lot of money to develop drugs and to do clinical tests and clinical trials. And antibiotic resistance is an increasing problem, but it just hasn't, um, hasn't reached that threshold point where people are willing to throw lots of money at it. It's killed a lot of people, but not enough for people to really invest in it, unfortunately. Um, so it'll probably take similar to, you know, COVID-19, we had Project Warp Speed to develop a vaccine for it because it was spreading so fast and causing so much disease and death that historically we've never thrown so much money at anything so fast infectious disease wise um, so uh, we'll see if if and when uh, antibiotic resistance becomes such a problem that we start throwing money at it as well so some of the urgent threats that I'm going to talk about um, Clostridium difficile so Clostridium difficile let's go back to the slide for a second so if we're talking about antibiotic resistant microbes, bacteria, fungi, all right, they caused in 2019, they were causing an average of, of 2.8 million infections a year and 35,000 deaths a year. That's a lot. It's nothing compared to, to COVID right now. And this is just in the US, all right. Um, Clostridium difficile, which actually has been renamed Clostridioides difficile, but whatever, everyone just calls it C. diff, all right, has had, it is technically not really that it's antibiotic resistant, but taking antibiotics 
for a, a prolonged period of time um, increases your risk and really leads to clostridium infections that are very difficult to treat. Um, and so it's a rising problem, particularly in nursing homes and healthcare facilities of these clusters. It causes really bad diarrhea, like untreatable diarrhea. So C. diff is on the rise, and that's a pretty big urgent threat. Um, a friend of mine actually works at the CDC, and she studies Candida auris and outbreaks of drug-resistant Candida auris, which is a fungus. Um, Acinetobacter is a naturally competent bacteria. So this is one of those bacteria that ha it's got a, a pretty advanced set of fishing, fishing lines and fishing rods, and it's really good at fishing for bacteria. So that's how it became resistant. And it's not usually something you'd think of as being terribly pathogenic, but because it can pick up all these antibiotic resistance, it's becoming more and more of a problem. Um, <clears throat> Some another concerning threat that I have on bold here is drug resistant Bordetella pertussis. Pertussis is whooping cough. We have a vaccine for this. We should not be getting drug resistant Bordetella pertussis because we should not be having pertussis cases. We have the ability to prevent it through vaccination, but we haven't um, been able to convince everyone to get the vaccine. And so the bacteria still exists in the population, it's still transmitted, and now, in addition to that, it's also becoming resistant to antibiotics. So just another reason to encourage vaccination. What we don't vaccinate against, we risk beco becoming antibiotic resistant. So some novel antimicrobial therapies, and this is an updated slide, so if you're going off the notes, you might wanna take some separate notes here. There have been some novel antibiotics that have been discovered in the past few years that were really exciting. Um, a big reason why anti antibiotic discovery stalled was because um, we sort of maxed out our ability to culture microbes in the lab. So in order to grow microbes like on a Petri dish, you can't grow just anything. So of all the microbes out there in the world, we can maybe grow like 0.1% of them in a lab, like a really tiny, like tiny proportion of bacteria we actually know how to culture. The rest only can survive in their natural environment and we can't study them if we can't grow them in the lab and so in 2015 a lab at northeastern university they created a novel culturing technique where they basically took this little chip and stuck it in soil and grew the bacteria right in the soil on this chip um, so they weren't transferring it to a petri dish; they just grew it there. And then, um, so they were able to to basically discover a lot of new bacteria in the soil that hadn't hadn't been discovered. And one of them, they found they, well, they found a bunch of different um, potential antibiotics. But this one, Texobactin, Texobactin, um, showed really promising techniques because it was selectively toxic so it was toxic to bacteria but not to human cells in tissue culture in 2018 another group found another anti potential antibiotic called malicidin and it was also discovered in soil but instead of using a, a novel culturing technique they were using genetic sequencing to detect different types of microbes and detect different types of compounds and so these two compounds have a lot of have shown a lot of profit profit a lot of um promise in the lab but they they haven't made it very far in um like clinical development because it takes first of all both of them are very difficult to synthesize because we can't grow the bacteria like we can't mass produce the bacteria in the lab and the compounds are very difficult to synthesize chemically. So it's very slow production. Um, they have to go through clinical testing in animals and then in people. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And there's just not enough of that to go around. So the last I checked, 
Tiaxobactin and malacidin were both in preclinical studies, so they haven't even moved into clinical trials yet. Um, and that just reminds you, just to remind you, in 1928, we discovered, uh, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, and it took like 17 years or something before it was in use in humans. And that rate and speed hasn't changed that much in terms of drug development. It really depends on the need, and the need determines how much money gets thrown at the project. So if we have a, a real um, global emergency of antibiotic resistant microbes, we might see more money thrown at these guys and, and more development. Um, but I think not, because I think these two uh, are going to be potential novel antimicrobial therapies. So the first one is bacteriophages, and you've, you've watched a TED talk uh, about a woman who saved her husband with some bacteriophages. She, he, her husband was uh, sick with an antimicrobial, uh, a multi-drug resistant bacteria. Um, so bacteriophages, remember, these are viruses that infect bacteria and kill bacteria. And the benefit of them is, A, they're selectively toxic, so they only infect bacterial cells, they won't infect human cells. And B, they're incredibly specific. So you can have bacteriophages that infect and kill only pathogenic E. coli, not commensal E. coli. Um, so they're incredibly narrow spectrum, if you want to put it that way. They're very narrow spectrum, which means that you can really very specifically target pathogens, which is great. The downside to them, um, there's a couple of downsides. One, they are actively proliferating and evolving things. And we don't have any other drugs on the market that can evolve like that. So they're kind of risky as a therapy because they can evolve on their own. Um, they also will require specification. So um, generally it would involve, you know, a company would have to create a whole, you know, banks, just libraries of different phages that infect different pathogens. And usually one phage doesn't do the trick. You need a cocktail of multiple different phages that will kill a certain pathogen. So it is um, rather expensive and rather personalized venture. Uh, and there are some there are some bacteriophage therapies that are used in Russia. Um, and there are some clinical trials in the US for bacteriophages, I think against MRSA, multi-drug resistant staph aureus, and maybe also Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which causes lung infections, really bad pneumonia. Um, but we haven't made a ton of progress in this wide scale. And then the newest area that I think is really going to take off because of the current use of monoclonal antibodies in COVID-19 is monoclonal antibodies. So antibodies are proteins that are made by the immune system when you have an infection. And usually you make a bunch of different antibodies to a bunch of different parts of the pathogen. And, and all of those antibodies are flowing through your blood. And for centuries, at least a century anyway, um, convalescent plasma or blood from someone who had an infection would be given to someone with an infection. So like um, tetanus and uh, diphtheria, okay? Those were often treated, people who were sick with that disease were treated with blood plasma antibodies from the blood of someone who recovered from the disease and had the antibodies. Um, we use a form of convalescent plaza for antitoxins as well, for like ant like snake venom and stuff. So what a monoclonal antibody is, monoclonal antibodies are made in a lab. So they're actually, they inject like animals um, and then they can take out the white blood cells, the antibody producing cells and they grow them in culture and just mass those cells just mass produce the antibodies in culture and so they can test each individual antibody and find a single antibody that's really really good at binding to and neutralizing the pathogen 
And so um, the one that's gotten a lot of press in the last year is Regeneron, which is a company in, in New York, just north of New York City, so southern New York. Um, and their monoclonal antibody against COVID-19 has really been helping people survive. So it's really, it's given to people who have um, COVID-19, who are having symptoms and have maybe severe disease, but before it works best before it's really severe. So someone who maybe has mild symptoms early on, um, but has high risk factors, I think we're like the classic people who would receive monoclonal antibodies. And basically the antibodies bound to the virus particles and prevented them from infecting cells and gave the immune system sort of a head start and a fighting chance. So um, they're not permanent. They don't stay in your body. They're, they're you know, short term. They, they stick around maybe for a month or two. Um, but and they just kind of help the body buy the they buy the body a little bit more time, buy the body's immune system a little bit more time. So Regeneron's and monoclonal is called, I think I can say it, BAM Lenivimab. It's such a mouthful that I've and I've heard in a podcast I listened to that doctors just call it BAM BAM. Um, it's the name of the monoclonal antibody against COVID-19. So there are other infections that there are monoclonal antibodies that have been in clinical trials for development for MRSA, for Pseudomonas, for a lot of these uh, pathogens that are on that urgent list. And I think that now they'll probably take off since, since Regeneron has been approved and used with great success. I think more funding might go into those therapies. It's very, um, uh, how do I put it? So if a monoclonal antibody were to stop working, you could pretty easily just find another one. So the way that, that these are developed um, very systematically in the lab is that if resistance evolves to one, they can just make, there's sort of an infinite number of antibodies that can be produced by living things, by cells. And if, and we've just learned how to stimulate that in a in a in a petri dish and then be able to um, isolate and purify those antibodies so my vote is that in the future monoclonal antibodies will become more popular uh, one of the downsides to them is they do have to be injected um, so a lot of times they have to be given in hospital though i know with regenerons i think they have um, gotten to the point where they can be injected at home so and there's other injectable medicines like insulin and, and hormone injections that people do themselves. So it's not unreasonable, but you know, it could be that someday you get a you get an infection and you can't take a pill. You have to go to the pharmacy and get yourself some syringes and a vial and inject yourself with monoclonal antibodies. But that um so that's where antibiotics are are. The other side is the side of prevention right so um uh and i want to say prevention through fostering our good microbes our friendly microbiome so we can do that and nourish our microbiome by either helping to repopulate it by consuming good bacteria in the form of foods or supplements and also by feeding the bacteria we have with bacteria food. And so some of the nutrients in our diet are actually not beneficial to our cells. They're beneficial because they benefit our bacterial cells. So um, a lot of fiber, a lot of soluble fiber in food, fiber is a nutrient that's really healthy for us, but we don't actually digest it. Our bodies, we don't have the enzymes needed to digest fiber, but a lot of our microbes do, and they take that fiber and they digest it into other molecules that actually make our guts healthier and make our gut cell, reduce inflammation in the gut. Okay, so probiotics are living, microbes found in foods and beverages like yogurt contains live active cultures of bacteria um, kefir is another one kombucha is a become more and more popular 
Um, those all contain, they all actually contain, I mean, you're drinking a bacterial culture, basically. Um, prebiotics are nutrients in food that feed your good bacteria. So things like fiber. Um, and fiber is found in lots of whole grain foods, whole grain breads, legumes, beans, uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, so this idea of promoting healthy gut bacteria to reduce your risk of infection um, is so popular that we've actually started treating disease with other people's microbes. We've been doing microbial transplants. And where do all the microbes in your body live in a high concentration? In your large intestine, in your poop. And so there is uh, such a thing as fecal matter transplants, or really now I think it stands for fecal microbiota transplants, where it literally is a poop transplant. So um, somebody is a poop donor and they take the stool from that donor and they basically blend it up in a blender and then they stick it up the patients um, into their large intestine doing using like a colonoscopy a colonoscope and they basically spray that uh, donor poop in there so they can repopulate the intestine with good microbes it's actually a treatment for Clostridium difficile, for, for recurrent C. diff infection. In fact, when they did the clinical trial for this, they did a clinical trial where they treated the placebo group, um, got, or the, you know, the control group got um, antibiotics, and the uh, treatment group, the, then the other group got these fecal microbiota transplants. And the, the fecal transplant group did so well, they recovered at such a high rate, they actually had to stop the trial and offer the fecal transplants to the people who were in the control group. Kind of similar to in the vaccine trials for, for coronavirus, once they had efficacy data and showed that the vaccine worked, they had to offer the vaccine to all the people in the control group because it was unethical to continue to not give them the vaccine when it had such good results. So um, FMT, fecal transplants, had, the, had a similar, similarly um, awesome effect. I don't know, this is a little bit dated, I, I do think there is a pill form now. Um, some facilities I think have the ability, they've, they've made an oral form, which I'm not sure is, any, is, is better. Like I'm not, I'm not sure which I would prefer, um, somebody's poop sprayed up my butt or somebody's poop put in a pill that I have to swallow. Neither one sounds very appetizing and fun, but at the same time, I'm such a nerd and think it's so cool to repopulate my microbes with the healthy dose of microbes that I think I could, I think I could swallow it. Um, but yeah, there's there's more and more understanding that we are gaining of the importance of the microbiome that I think fecal pills, um, I don't think they'll be called that. I think we'll learn more about the bacteria in feces that are so beneficial, and then we'll make probiotic pills, not from poop, but from bacteria that we, cocktails of bacteria that we culture, that we just originally discovered in poop. Um, so when somebody has an infection, before you can treat them with antibiotics, you need to figure out what infection they actually have. So you need to know the identity of the microbe that's causing the infection, and you need to know if it has any resistance. So is it susceptible or sensitive to drugs, or is it resistant to them? Um, and then you also need to know the condition of the patient, because some drugs, while it might work to kill the bacteria might um, uh, have bad interactions with other medical conditions or other drugs that the patient is having. So prescribing antibiotics is quite a complicated algorithm, really. Um, but it's going to start with a culture and sensitivity, a CNS, which is when you're going to take a swab or take a blood 
culture or take a urine sample um, in order to determine what, what is causing the infection and what drugs it's sensitive for. Um, anti antibiotic sensitivity testing is especially needed for bacteria that have a high rate of antibiotic resistance, like various staph species, Neisseria, gonorrhea, which causes gonorrhea. There's a lot of resistant strains of that. Um, so it's not just enough to know what the, what the bacteria is, but also to do specific antibiotic sensitivity testing. So we do this in lab um, quite frequently. So the different types of antibiotic sensitivity testing are the Kirby-Bauer technique, sometimes called the DISC technique, you'll see in a future slide. The E-test, which is very similar to the Kirby-Bauer technique, except you use a strip um, with antibiotic on it of different concentrations, like so it's a gradient strip. Um, and then the tube dilution method, which uh, we is, is, well, I don't know that it's less common, but it's just a different method. All right, so the Kirby-Bauer technique, um, we often do in lab, and you will do it in virtual lab, where you plate bacteria, so you spread bacteria all over the plate. And um, then you put these disks that look like little, like hole-punched, pieces of filter paper around the plate and each of those discs has been soaked in some antibiotic and you put those around the plate and then you incubate it and in areas where there's no antibiotic disc you get lots of bacterial growth so this represents a lawn this opaque area here here's the lawn of bacteria but then around the disc you get what's called a zone of inhibition the zone of inhibition is the region where no bacteria are growing because the antibiotic is actually leaking out of this disc into the culture, the surrounding culture, and inhibiting bacterial growth. So the larger the zone of inhibition, the um, better that antibiotic works, or the more sensitive the bacteria is. So a large zone of inhibition means the bacteria is sensitive. A small zone of inhibition means that it is resistant. So in this one here, a very large zone of inhibition, and we would say that it, we would use the letter S to indicate that this bacteria is sensitive to this antibiotic enrofloxacin, but it is resistant because it has a very small zone of inhibition around oxytetracycline. Um, and so for each drug and each bacteria, there's a table that you can reference. So you would measure that zone of inhibition straight across the basically the circumference, no, not the circumference, the diameter of that circle is the zone of inhibition. And you compare it to a chart. And if it's larger, whatever, there's different, cat. it tells you how big it has to be in order to be resistant or susceptible. So um, the e-test is very similar, except in, instead of using a small disc that has a, a certain, you know, high concentration of an of a, um, antibiotic on it, the e-test the e uses a strip that has a gradient. So it has very high concentrations and then lower and lower dilutions as you go down the strip. And so this not only tells you whether uh, bacteria is sensitive or resistant, it tells you what concentration it's sensitive and res resistant to. So it gives you the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration. So for this antibiotic here, we look at the strip and I would say maybe like 0.125 is, seems to be the minimum inhibitory concentration. Then you might give them 0.19 or 0.25 concentration as a drug just to be safe. So there's no need to over-treat someone and give them a very high concentration of a drug. If you don't need to, you always want to give them the lowest amount of, the lowest concentration of drug that's effective in order to minimize toxicity results. And then the tube dilution is another method where you take tubes of culture and you add different amounts of antibiotic to it. And you look for, so this is, um, a very low amount of antibiotic in this tube and then the amount of antibiotic gets higher and higher as we go this way. So you look for the tube that you inoculate each of those tubes with 
bacteria and whichever tube wherever it stops being able to grow so in this case here all right we have bacteria in this tube this tube this tube there's a few bacteria still growing at this concentration but no bacteria grow at this concentration 6.4 micrograms per milliliter so the minimum inhibitory concentration here would be 6.4 micrograms per milliliter um, and then of course anything greater than that is also inhibitory this is a similar test using a 96 well plate so they could test multiple drugs at multiple concentrations um, in this dish and so the, the wells with the x's in this case they looked for a color change pink represented bacterial growth and blue meant there was no growth and so they put an x on the first well where they saw no growth and so um, that well determined what concentration of the drug needed to be used so this bacteria whatever the bacteria is um, is pretty sensitive to amb whatever that drug is and intra because at fairly low concentrations it's inhibitory versus the fluke all right uh, you have to use really high concentrations of that one in order to inhibit bacterial growth so that one's probably not the best drug of choice um, the best drug of choice here might be this vori actually down here which has the the lowest concentration that's the lowest minimum inhibitory concentration the lowest mic um, but the choice of drug is going to be more complicated than that because we need to know what the side effects of all those drugs are so the mic is the minimum inhibitory concentration you find it by making lots of tubes that have different concentrations of antibiotic and adding some bacteria to each of them the same amount of bacteria and whichever ones the bacteria does not grow that you don't get proliferation of bacteria um, then that's the mini minimum inhibitory concentration it doesn't mean that that is enough to kill all the bacteria though so the minimum inhibitory concentration is often just bacteriostatic you're inhibiting growth you're not necessarily killing and so in all of these tubes here we don't know if that if that concentration is microbostatic or microbicidal and if we really want to kill bacteria we want to um, have it be a microbicidal concentration and so we check microbicidal of, of, um, uh, effect by taking a sample so we take some a sample of this from this tube here where it looks like bacteria there's no bacterial growth all right but we check to see if any bacteria are still alive by transferring some culture from this tube into a fresh tube with no antibiotics so these tubes here have no antibiotics um, and when we transfer a little bit of culture into these tubes we find that at these three concentrations we are still getting bacterial growth so in these three tubes here the bacteria aren't dead they're just static they're not growing but in this tube here when we transfer it to fresh culture we don't get any more growth so at this concentration we've actually killed the bacteria so this would be the minimum bactericidal concentration versus this one which is the minimum inhibitory concentration All right so when we're prescribing drugs when prescribers are prescribing drugs um, we have to take into effect also the toxicity and the side effects of those drugs <clears throat> so um, we calculate something called the therapeutic index and the therapeutic index is the toxic dose divided by the minimum inhibitory concentration so the toxicity um, that what dose is toxic to the person all right so pretty much all drugs will I, they're, they're toxic at some concentration so ideally you want drugs that have a high toxicity dose in other words you have to take a large amount of it in order for it to be toxic and you want ones that work at a very low concentration so ideally you want the minimum inhibitory concentration to be low so if the numerator is large and the denominator is small then this number the therapeutic index would be large so the larger the therapeutic index 
the better it is. The therapeutic index is just a ratio that compares the toxicity versus the effectiveness at killing the microbes. Um, so yeah, you want a higher therapeutic index because <clears throat> that means it's a lower toxicity. So physicians have to take all that stuff into account, the minimum inhibitory dose, the toxicity. They also have to take into account things like drug allergies, other conditions that would um, cause them to have negative effects to a drug, any other medications that they're taking that might have drug interactions, any issues with liver or kidney function, because your liver and kidney are the ones that metabolize these drugs. Um, all of these things have to be taken into account when prescribing medications to someone. There's actually an app for it now. There's also reference texts that um, doctors will reference in order to make sure that they're prescribing the appropriate drug for a person. So the last bit, and I'm sorry this lecture is going on so long, is um, talking about, so we've mostly just focused on antibacterial drugs, antibiotics, um, but there's also other classes to treat other organisms, parasites, viruses, and fungi. So there's anti-helminthics or anti-parasitics for protozoan parasites. There's antivirals and there's antifungals. The problem is that these guys um, are more like our cells. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms. Protists and helminths are eukaryotic organisms. They have a lot of the same cell parts that we do, so it's harder to be selectively toxic. And viruses straight up use our cells. So um, all of these are saying, don't use antibiotics on us. They won't work. Because antibiotics are for bacteria. Okay, so there are antifungals to treat fungal infections. <clears throat> Not nearly as many antifungals as there are antibiotics. Um, the one thing, the one category I do want you to recognize here are the azoles because they're so super common. They all end in azole, so fluconazole, clometrazole, or clotrimazole, I guess I said that wrong. Um, ketoconazole, a lot of these are over-the-counter antifungals that you can buy for like jock itch, skin fungal infections, for yeast infections. Um, so that suffix azole is usually indicates an antifungal medication. So if you learn that now, that'll be helpful for, for you in the future. Also, anything that has fungo in it, like mycofungin, is also a good sign that it's a, an antifungal medication. We also have agents to treat protozoal infections. Um, the biggest protozoan disease is this anti is a malaria. Malaria is a huge. It's one of the top three global infectious diseases um, killers. And this is these are malaria parasites, and these are red blood cells. This is showing you malaria in um, a blood culture. So the most effective treatment for malaria is quinine and quinine derived drugs called quinolones. Um, but there are there is actually a lot of resistance forming to quinolones. Another drug that's been more recently developed is something called artemisinin. Artemisinin also has good activity against uh, plasmodium, which is the malaria parasite. Um, a lot of times they're used in combination. So quinolones plus artemisinin is the best treatment. <clears throat> this is just an awesome video that I have to show you about the history of um, malaria drug development. It's very short. Or maybe it's not here. Um, let's say it's Ted Ed. Here we go. This is it. 
NPR, not Ted. From a fish stick to a lipstick to a hand-sized plate, use a little square and not more. The word malaria comes from the Latin for bad air, because physicians used to think the disease was caused by toxic vapors rising from marshes. But malaria isn't caused by vapors, or a bacteria, or a virus. It's caused by a tiny parasite, one that stows away in the salivary glands of a female mosquito. And when that mosquito bites a person, the parasite invades the body, causing headaches and fevers that can be fatal if left untreated. When another mosquito drinks an infected person's blood, some of the parasites can hitch a ride to their next host. Europeans had no defense against malaria until the 1600s when a Jesuit priest in Peru encountered cinchona, a medicinal plant used by the native people. Its bark, ground up, could ward off malaria, and some claimed it could do much more. But this quinine, as it was called, was extremely bitter, so British troops in India mixed it with carbonated water, sugar, lime, and alcohol, creating the gin and tonic. In the 20th century, scientists began to develop anti-malarial drugs, some based on the chemical structure of quinine, and the drugs worked for a while. Then the parasites began to evolve resistance, first in Southeast Asia, then in South America, and then Africa. Back in 1962, as the Vietnam War escalated, North Vietnamese fighters started dying of drug-resistant malaria, and Mao demanded that Chinese scientists solve the problem. They studied ancient texts and thousands of traditional Chinese herbs and found that an extract of sweet wormwood, a plant that had been used in Chinese medicinal teas for 2,000 years, could kill malaria parasites. Mao scientists used the plant to develop artemisinin, a new drug that worked faster than anything doctors had tried before. But because of distrust between China and the West, decades passed before it was widely used. Today. It is a major defense against malaria throughout the world. In 2008, though, scientists reported cases of resistance to artemisinin in Cambodia, and then Thailand and Myanmar. Experts say it will be at least five years before the next drug comes along. So, a little fun history for you. The uh, invention of gin and tonic was a... Malaria prevention. Um, some other protozoan infections, uh, Giardia and Entamoeba histolytica, are intestinal protozoan diseases that cause really bad diarrhea. And uh, flagyl or metronidazole is an antibiotic. Actually, it can be used to treat uh, anti. It can be used to treat Helicobacter pylori, which causes gastric ulcers. Um, but it's also used as these, so it, it treats a lot of intestinal uh, bacteria and protozoans, I guess we could say. Um, and anti-helminthics, anti-helminthics, I, I said that azoles are usually antifungals, but I guess there's a lot of anti-helminthics that also end in azol, so maybe not the greatest mnemonic there. Um, albendazole and mabendazole are two anti-helminthics. They don't actually kill worms. They tend to paralyze the worms, and the worms usually uh, have some mechanism to bite and grasp or have a sucker or have teeth. That is how they hold on to the intestines. And so if you paralyze them, then they just you just poop them out. Most of them are intestinal. Um, and so that's how those drugs work. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of these <clears throat> different anti-helminthics. You don't have to memorize any of these, but just for fun, if you want to know them. But again, helminthic infections, not terribly common in, in the developed countries, in humans anyway. Your pets, though, might you might recognize some of these drugs uh, as veterinary medications that your pets have taken. Um, for viruses, again, we really don't have a ton of antiviral medications. We do have some for 
herpes viruses and for HIV that we'll talk about more specifically when we talk about those viruses, but really there's very few good antiviral therapies. Um, so the best treatment we have for viruses is, of course, prevention through vaccines. We have vaccines for a number of different viruses, measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox, chickenpox, polio, hepatitis A and B, human papillomavirus, rotavirus, rabies, and now we can add SARS-CoV-2 to the list as well. And also Ebola, we have an effective, and yellow fever, actually there's several on here that I haven't included. So. Vaccines are incredibly effective, but they're very expensive to develop and they're not profitable because you essentially, the idea is to use them once and then people don't get sick. So it's um, really hard to get the money to develop vaccines. But as we've seen this year, if you have enough money, you can make things happen. Um, vaccines can be developed there. It's not it's not a really a, an impossible task if you have the money to do it. Scientists are very capable of doing it. Um, so, so that's where we're at with viral, with treating virus infection. So here's a list of the good antiviral drugs that we have. Um, and you'll notice that on this list, we have HIV, 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 influenza, which is, these are okay they're not great drugs for influenza. We do have acyclovir is a great drug for herpes viruses. And then we have some that work against um, hemorrhagic fevers and respiratory syncytial virus, but mm, not great. So really not a lot of um, antiviral drugs here, but the way they work is either they block virus entry by binding to the surface, surface proteins, um, or they inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. And these often have toxic side effects because they usually inhibit our nucleic acid synthesis as well. And a lot of HIV drugs fall into this category. Um, so another thing that has to do with antibiotics is they do oftentimes have side effects. They're not perfectly selectively toxic. So you will have side effects. Sometimes it's uh, something like an allergy, an allergic response. And we'll talk more about allergic responses in the next unit, and how they, they form, but they form through exposure. So a lot of times people will find that they take a drug and they're fine. And then the next time they're prescribed the drug, they suddenly have an allergic reaction to it, which is why your doctor will ask you every single time they prescribe you medication, do you have any drug allergies? And you might be like, I told you for the 100th time, but they have to ask every time because they can develop at any time. So it's always a relevant question. Um, another very common side effect of antibiotics is diarrhea due to disruption of the intestinal normal bacteria, the normal flora, that can result in disruption of digestion. Um, but uh, uh, another thing that can happen from killing, another effect of killing off your normal flora, your good microbes, are super infections. Basically, so some of the good microbes get killed off and some of the other good microbes overgrow. And when they're overgrown, they're not really good anymore, I guess is one way to put it. So very common um, super infections are yeast infections. And C. diff, Clostridium difficile, actually a lot of people are carriers of C. diff. It doesn't cause them diarrhea or discomfort, but when you take antibiotics, you kill off other microbes and it allows the C. diff to overgrow, and then you're kind of stuck. Um, yeast infections are very common, particularly in females, vaginal yeast infections after taking antibiotics because it kills normal flora of the vagina and that changes the environment and the yeast that normally live there, they just get to overgrow. Um, some antibiotics also can be toxic to organs in the body, particularly the liver and kidney, which process those drugs. So this is just a um, slide showing you what a super infection is. I'm gonna move. So this table on the left here just lists a variety of different side effects that can be caused by different drugs. So it's something that doctors and patients as well need to be aware of if they're taking a medication to look out for those different side effects. So you don't need to know any of those, but um, in case you're curious, there's the table for you to look at. And then on the right here, um, it's showing you 
uh, what happens in a super infection. So you have some infection, uh, maybe you take some antibiotics and the antibiotic destroys a whole bunch of, of microbes uh, around it. And then that the one that's re that doesn't get killed, like yeasts don't get killed by antibiotics because they're fungi. And so all the, all the bacteria around them die and then they have all this room to grow. C. diff also, C. diff happens to just be sort of naturally resistant to antibiotics. And so all the other microbes in the gut get killed and now C. diff can overgrow. And that's what a super infection is. A super infection is really just an overgrowth of bacteria that are, or or fungi that are already there and have been able to overgrow. Um, so the issue with antibiotics is that they lead to antibiotic resistant. And this has been a huge problem. <clears throat> so um, we have really contributed to the problem. We invented, we found antibiotics, but then we overused them and that has contributed to antibiotic resistance. And so over the past decade or two, there's really been a huge push to reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used by doctors. Once upon a time, antibiotics were just given as sort of the cure-all, like, oh, you have a headache? Here, just take this antibiotic. Um, so a lot of times they were being prescribed even when they really weren't effective. And so we've been overusing them. Um, they have done audits of antibiotic prescription use and, uh, and have found that sometimes up to 75% of prescriptions that are given out were not for bacterial disease, they were for virus infections. Now, there can still be good reason to give someone antibiotics if they have a viral infection, because viral infections, some viral infections can be followed by secondary bacterial infections. So like a lung infection, sometimes if it's viral, you, you might be given antibiotics not to treat the viral infection, but to prevent secondary bacterial infection. Uh, but you can't treat a virus infection with an antibiotic. Um, in some countries, not the US, but in some countries, people can buy antibiotics over the counter. They don't need a prescription. And so then it's really willy-nilly people treating themselves with antibiotics. Another common practice in the country is um, people not finishing their antibiotics and saving them and then self-prescribing later on and taking leftover antibiotics. And then there's also the issue of using antibiotics in the food industry. So we grow cattle and chickens in very high, high and dense populations where disease spreads very easily between them. So instead of waiting for all of the cows and chickens to get sick, which they inevitably will because of their living conditions, they're instead just given antibiotics in their feed to prevent them from getting sick so that they can grow them in these very dense populations. And so we have used a lot of antibiotics in the food industry. And so a lot of um, foodborne illnesses have become antibiotic resistant. They've evolved in the chickens and the cows and, and then entered the, you know, human food, food chain. So yeah, that is the problem with antibiotic resistance. So we really um, don't be mad at your doctor if you if you have a cold and you go in and they say, no, we can't give you antibiotics because you have a viral infection. Don't be mad. It's not that they're refusing to treat you. They're actually trying to protect you from infections with antibiotic resistant microbes and just the evolution, reduce the evolution of those. So that's all I have. I'm going to shut up now. The end.